Hello and welcome back to Rewildology, the show that explores conservation, travel, and rewilding the planet. I am your host, Brooke Mitchell, conservation biologist and adventure traveler. What is one of the most valuable resources that every living being on this planet needs? A resource so common that we almost forget how necessary it is for life. In developed parts of the world, we use it frivolously, throwing it on the ground, while in developing countries, having easy access to this resource is one of the top priorities. As the climate changes and there's less of this resource to go around, we're starting to realize that we must drastically change our relationship with this resource if human and wildlife communities are to thrive well into the future. What is this resource I'm referring to? Fresh water, rivers, lakes, streams, aquifers, the veins of our planet that carry life-giving water to terrestrial species. I got to know one of these life-giving rivers quite personally. The Colorado River and its watershed is one of the most important river systems in the United States and Mexico and supports over 40 million people, staggering swaths of agricultural land and countless wild areas. The Colorado River is in dire straits, however, and today's guest made it his mission to show everyone the life the Colorado River still supports and how important it is that we change our relationship with our rivers no matter where we reside. In this episode, I am sitting down with Dave Shewater, professional conservation photographer. Dave and his wife Marla spent countless hours exploring the Colorado Rockies throughout their marriage and witness firsthand the life the Colorado River supports. So when he heard people say that the Colorado River was dead, he knew in his heart that that just wasn't true. Six years ago, Dave had the marvelous idea of traveling from the Colorado headwaters and the Never Summer Mountain Range to the final delta in Mexico to show people how alive the river still is and meet river keepers that have dedicated their lives to protecting the river. Dave's brand new book called Living River, The Promise of the Mighty Colorado just dropped in stores and I had the opportunity to snag an early copy to record this episode for you all. Dave and I explore why the Colorado system has reached such a critical point, why he decided to write a book above all other media types, and how he met the incredible people protecting and restoring the river. We also share a deep personal moment at the end. And woo, get ready for some tears, everyone. <laughs> All right, I won't keep you waiting any longer. Please enjoy this conversation with Dave. Well, hi, Dave. Thank you so much for sitting down with me and taking me through the journey that is living river and how you put this together and why in your story and all the things. But first, I think I need a little bit of context of how all of this came to be. So just out of curiosity, do you remember your first camera and why did you decide to become a wildlife photographer? Yeah. So it was about 1989. My wife and I Marla did a, a backpacking trip in the Grand Canyon and I had a point and shoot camera and I thought I was making amazing pictures and I wasn't. <laughs> uh, when I get my back, I had a, you know, a bunch of lousy pictures, but I was really taken by that landscape and we were at that point quite grounded in nature. And as soon as we got back from that trip, I told Marla, I want to buy a real camera. And I did, and I bought an SLR and it immediately changed the way that I interpret the world around me. And, and it, it just changed how I see. And, and from that point forward, I, very early on, I told Marla, I'd like to be a full-time photographer. And I, at the time I was a sales rep in industrial sales and I had a 23 year career that was successful and all that stuff, but it wasn't me. And, mm -hmm. and, and so th th there was this confluence of photography changing how I see the world and, being in this relationship with a beautiful person who loved nature every bit as much as I, I do. And so it was, that's how it started. 
So then after that, well, what did you do to learn how to become so talented in this specific thing? Because I know we now have these apps like Instagram where we can see all this fantastic wildlife photography, but I think that there's a disconnect between like how you actually see and get that beautiful picture and the journey that someone takes to be able to view the world and do that. So do you have any, I guess, secrets or how, how did you figure it out? Essentially, <laughs> figuring it out. And well, it's just, it's just, uh, it's just part of your journey. I guess I started, I was reading outdoor photographer magazine and that geo, and I was, I was, you know, studying pictures and learning how the, you know, interpreting how they're made. And I was following several photographers and looked up to those folks as guides, uh, even though I didn't know them, I was just following their work. Yeah, there was no internet, there was no nothing, but there were magazines and magazines were really powerful back then. You know, we, of course, the whole world has changed in terms of how we share our work and connect with one another. There was two workshops in there. One in Montana was about storytelling. And from that workshop, I started a project, the instructor, David Middleton and uh, suggested that we we start a project, and at that workshop, I decided, you know what, nobody's telling stories about the Colorado Prairie, so I'm just going to start a project about the prairie, and that that ended up being a four year project while I was full, uh, you know full time employed in my sales job, and I published a book called Prairie Thunder with Skyline Press in Colorado. And then uh, 2006, I went to the North American Nature Photographer Association Summit in Denver, and I saw several photographers speak. And uh, it was Robert Glenn Ketchum, it was a guy from Louisiana, and then the third guy was uh, Michael Forsberg, and he presented his Sandhill Cranes work. And in that moment, I thought, this is where I belong. And it was also at the same time that the International League of Conservation Photographers was formed. And those folks came from Alaska where they had the first meeting down to the Denver meeting of the North American Nature Photographers Association or NAMPA. And at the NAMPA meeting, I met some of my heroes and I realized people are actually doing good with photography and stories. And that makes a lot more sense to me than just making an individual pictures, pretty pictures, which there's nothing wrong with. I don't, I don't mean to, to say anything bad about that, but it just made sense to me to, to be telling stories. And so from that day forward, I thought, I, you know, I want to be a conservation photographer. I want to be part of the International League of Conservation Photographers and be in this, this business of change through imagery and, and, and story. And so I became great friends with Mike Forsberg and got tied into his Platte Basin time-lapse project, which is studying rivers over time and asking the question, where does your water come from? Where does it go and how is it used? So I was really keen, I was really tuned in to rivers, um, but I was working on a project about the sagebrush ecosystem at the same time. And, and it, that ended up being a six year project. And I published the book Sage Spirit with Braided River, who is my current publisher, joined the International League of Conservation Photographers in 09 and I've been plugged into the conservation network, sort of de getting deeper and deeper ever since. So that's, you know, it's it, it's a long journey, but it's it's a progression of building a network, building individual relationships, sort of tuning into who is doing the best work on the conservation side, and and making you know deep connections that end up being long lasting lifetime friendships. So I'm really really grateful for this journey. Amazing. Very fortunate. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to get all into your latest project here soon. But before we do, I'm really curious to hear a little bit more about that organization you just talked about. Did you say it's the International League of Conservation Photographers? Was that, did I get that name correct? Correct, or ILCP. Yeah, could you actually maybe just give them a little plug or explain a little bit further what that is? Just I'm personally connected with a lot of up and coming photographers, and I feel that maybe they would be very interested in learning more about this organization. So could you maybe just explain it, what it is a little bit further? So it's a collective of photographers around the world who are doing 
important conservation work. And there's an application process um, and a small staff led by Susan Norton, who's doing a fabulous job. And we have a really strong board of directors. And there's about 130 of us, I think, in the world. And I, probably on every continent except for Antarctica, certainly we have people that go there. But everybody's doing their own conservation projects and it's it's using different media forms. So I think we were founded mostly on stills, but then DSLRs starting had started having video capability and and people started doing remarkable things, you know, in these rough outdoor environments. And so in time we invited motion photographers also just, you know doesn't matter what media you're using as long as you're telling good stories and bringing people along with you on the journey towards hopefully good conservation outcomes that's that's what everybody's after so it's it's pretty wild to be part of that network and and see the incredible work that folks are doing all over the globe and uh, occasionally we meet uh, sometimes we meet regionally we've had some meetings in Jackson Hall we had a wild speak event that we've done four or five times in Washington DC all of that stuff is is difficult to pull off, but you know we're I think we're in in some respects figuring out how to present the ILCP to the world, you know, and 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 bring, invite more people into the fold to to be a part of a movement that is global in scale, but it's it's a lot of us doing individual projects, and and so it's not easy to describe the ILCP, but it's really important to have a collective of, of folks doing this work that are able to uh, at times work together on projects like Michael Forsberg and, and me uh, just being a part of the Platte Basin Time Lapse, which is a, that's a whole storytelling ecosystem about rivers and just another remarkable piece of, of the ILCP's extended work. Wow, I mean, that sounds incredible <laughs> i don't know if i could if i have any value or services that i could offer your organization but by all means if there's some way that rewatology could help in that just by like by all means let me know because i completely believe in what you're doing and what your work is but i just wanted to throw that out there and anyone listening reach out to dave to learn more about the ilcp Anyways, let's get to the main topic of today. So you are an established, a respected, a published conservation photographer. And I'm sure with your passion, you could have done any conservation issue that your heart set out to do and tell an incredible story around it. Why did you decide to dedicate the last six years of your life to the Colorado River? That's... <laughs> The beginning is kind of funny. Um, so I was in Washington, D.C. to do a presentation at the Audubon National Meeting in 2015. I had one pre-press copy of my Sage Spirit book. So that book wasn't even out in the world yet. I was certainly not looking for another project. But I was attuned to the plight of rivers, particularly Western rivers. And... At that meeting, I was invited to a breakout session for the Western Rivers Action Network, which is Audubon's multi-layered campaign for rivers, because of course, in arid environments and, and everywhere, birds birds go to the water, right? And all the animals go to the water. So it, it sounds funny that a bird group would be advocates for rivers, but but everything starts with habitat, right? No habitat, no animals, and so forth. Anyway, so I went to this Western Rivers meeting and and I was just so impressed by how layered and how deep this this campaign was. I, did, I was not impressed by the visuals. And I went up to <laughs> Brian, the presenter afterwards and said, I'm Dave, you know, I maybe I can help a little bit. And I was there with my good friend, Allison Holleran, who's the executive director of Audubon Rockies. And she says she has a way of giving me like gentle nudges, like, you know, Dave, you, you might think about this for your next project, that sort of thing. Left DC, kind of thinking about all of that. And shortly thereafter, I heard an expert say, a watershed expert say the Colorado River is dead. And mm. and I thought, damn, that that's just not right. That's not my experience. You know, Marla and I have been roaming these <clears throat> these mountains and the wild places in Colorado for a lot of years by then. And 
that wasn't my experience. Everywhere there's flow, there is life. There is abundant, vibrant, dynamic life in flow wherever rivers are running, you know? And so I just got kind of ticked off. And, and I had this thought that in the beginning that we must always have rivers flowing through us. And, you know, there's 40 million people in this watershed and every one of us owes everything we have to the Colorado River. And so then it became a process of, of talking to folks. And, and I was at that point, I was doing a lot of presentations and traveling around for my sage book. But I had I had the Colorado River on my mind and and those early meetings and, and sort of inputs that you're hearing in the media. That was the beginning. And, and so it, it started with that idea of rivers flowing through us. And, and then about the interconnectedness of rivers and one thing led to another. And I, you know, the other thing I thought Brooke too was when I, when I got serious about maybe doing a story, I thought nobody's going to ever care if all we show them is bathtub rings around reservoirs. Yes. And there's now, now you see it. And I, I think we're all kind of being exposed to all of these stories about the Colorado River being a dying river. And it's true in the sense that we're having difficulty delivering water to people and to agriculture, particularly in the lower part of the Colorado River Basin. But the water still has to flow to get to that lower part. And wherever it flows, there is life. And that's the part that I find really interesting. And what made you decide on a book with how many different media types there are out there nowadays? Hmm. What hmm. was it specifically about a book that drew you to just print media? And like, this is how I want to tell the story. Yeah, I agree with you. There's, there's a lot of ways to tell a story and, and they're all good. I'm just, so I had already done one book with Braided River and I'm kind of wired to to studying places over time. I think so many stories, you know, particularly now in this moment on the Colorado River watershed, I can look at a story and go, well, they didn't spend any time there. You know, they, there's no depth to these, to these stories. And, and for me, where it's at is to go back to places over and over and over and to photograph with intention and to get to know the people and the place in a meaningful way. And then I can talk about it. You know, if I go someplace for three or four days, I can do a quick story probably and do an interview, but I'm not going to have that that depth of understanding. And so in this case, I talked to Braided River. Helen Cherulo is the executive director. She is amazing. And she Braided River is the only book producer who all they do is publish conservation photography books as foundations for long-term campaigns. And I think there's just a lot, of, a lot of power in that. There's a lot of potential to bring more people to the issue, to the story, and, and to get into the, all of the layered depth of, of that story. And all of that intrigues me. And the idea of building a story over time, I think is it's just a really cool way to work. And I don't even yeah. know if I answered your question, but to me, <laughs> to me, I think books matter. I think books are a, um, they, they capture a period of time, right? One last thing about books is there's a permanence and, and we're in a society where everything is fleeting and it's bits and clicks and, you know, people dancing on TikTok and, and then you have something that has a permanence to it. And, and there's a, there's something foundational and weighty about having a book in hand that you don't get with other ephemeral types of media. I use the word foundation a lot, so does Braided River, but they're the only ones that do what they do and they're really good at it. And you can take the book and you can create other assets, right? You can produce video pieces that tie into the story and you go out and give talks. You can have photo exhibits that travel around um, it's all scalable, and that's that adds layers upon layers to the power of a book. So, and that's that's how Braided River looks at it. Is it's all scalable, and we have like one author, Florian Schultz. He did a book and an IMAX movie about the oh, Arctic. Oh wow! So that so that's big scale stuff, right? You can a book can take you a lot of places. 
and I highly recommend picking up a copy, even just to go through the photos and the visuals. And there's so many times that I just stopped and I looked, I just had to, I was transported to wherever you were currently standing and taking the photo of whatever it is that you were taking a photo of. And I love nature documentaries. I've had the pleasure of, you know, being a pre-selection judge for Jackson a wild and like all of these other amazing films that have moved me to tears. And I feel like that, that would almost be like phase two of this, but phase one is giving us the foundation of what the actual story is. And that is why I love your book so much. It's, I learned so much. And then I also had the time to absorb the story, if that makes sense. Like, and I could read, I read the caption of every single photo, <laughs> like every single one. I was all, almost to the point I had to make myself stop and like, okay, let me get through this photo. I mean, like this page so that I could read the caption and go back to the photo because I was just, I just wanted to go just scroll through all of your photos because they're so just deep, if that makes sense. Like you were very selective on the photos that you chose. And, and I'm going to ask about that later. We're not going to get to that part right now. We still have a lot more background information to get through, but yeah, I, and that, but that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to ask why a book, because so many people would say that books are dead and someone, me personally, who reads a ton of books and also has, I've had another author on the show. I have two more coming up. I have been reading two other books now for authors on the show. Like there's something about a book that just no other media can touch. And that get, like you said, they're all good, but there's something about a book. But let's get into the contents of this book. So- Maybe for context, those of us that have lived in Western United States, we know what the Colorado is and, and where it flows, but anyone else in even the Eastern part of the United States or, or anywhere else on the globe might not know this river. So could you teach us maybe a little bit more, where does the Colorado begin? Where does it end? What states does it flow through? How big is it? The, all those kinds of things. So the Colorado River is in the Western United States, it is seven US states and two Mexican states. And when the Colorado River Compact was created in 1922, was drafted, it was a collaboration of those seven US states. And they separated, the framers separated the Colorado River into an upper and lower basin. So the upper basin states are Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and New Mexico. And the lower basin states are California, Arizona, and Nevada. And then in Mexico, you have Baja and Sonora. The river starts, I think of it in two places. The official headwaters are in the Never Summer Mountains on the west side of Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. And that's that's the biggest amount of flow. So that's why that's designated as the headwaters. And then further north is the Green River headwaters, which are in the Wind River range. And there's four major uh, US river systems that are born in the uh, Wind River range. Green River flows from the winds down to Canyon lands. And that's where the confluence with the Colorado is. And then there's a whole bunch of tributaries that flow into the Colorado. And I think of those as arteries. If you think of it like a human nervous system or mycelium crawling across the forest floor, that's the arteries are uh, the life force for the main stem of the big river. It flows, you know, we, we know, let's, let's say the Grand Canyon is a touchstone. So the Colorado River flows southwest out of Colorado into a little bit of Utah and Arizona hits Lake Powell. And that was part of what, what came from the Colorado River Compact was, was water storage to control the river. Um, there was a, a big thirst to, to create the Hoover Dam and Lake Mead because the river was completely out of control when it went through Yuma, Arizona, it would just wipe out crops because massive spring floods would happen. The river carries enormous amounts of of sediment and, and it flowed continuously from its headwaters to the sea for 6 million years until 1960. And then it started drying up in the Mexican desert. So the river has to flow to reach the downstream users in the big agricultural users are the Yuma, Arizona lettuce fields, almost 
All of the greens grown in North America come from Yuma. So when we eat a salad in North America, we are eating the Colorado River. And then a little bit to the west is the Imperial Valley of California, and that's pretty much all the vegetables and all the produce that we eat in wintertime is produced there. And on the Mexican side are the Mexicali agricultural fields. And that's why the river dries up in Mexico as it crosses the border and takes a hard right turn at the Morales Dam and all of that water gets shunted over to the Mexicali ag fields. But there's also a story of hope there. So I don't know, th those are some of the contours. I think the main thing folks need to know is uh, where does your water come from? We need to be asking that question. And my water comes from two places, uh, or it actually comes from the same place. If you look on the Continental Divide just west of Denver, on the east side, all of that snow melt that's piling up right now as we speak, on the east side will flow to the Platte Basin, and on the west side will flow to the Colorado River Basin. And in Denver, I'm in the Denver metro area, our water is pretty much half Platte Basin water and half Trans Mountain diverted Colorado River water that gets diverted through the Moffat Tunnel from the west side, gets sent underneath the Rocky Mountains to join South Boulder Creek and flow to the Denver metro area. So it's it's important to know that, that this, this river system is called the hardest working river in large part because it's so heavily diverted and also because the water gets used over and over and over as, as it travels south from its headwaters. I hope yeah. that wasn't too much technical no, stuff. No, that was good. That was good. So two things. One, I definitely know the Never Summer Mountains very well, having lived in Grand Lake for months and visiting Rocky Mountain National Park. is just such a phenomenal place. And just to know that that area is, is the launch point of one of the most important water systems in the United States is just incredible just the, to know the scale of that and then i have a question what happened in 1960 why did the water stop flowing all the way down well that's that's that mexican diversion to the mexicali mm. uh, ag fields so yeah it's <laughs> we would have a really long conversation if we got into the last 100 years and how, you know all the decisions that were made to move water. But the decision was made uh, by the Mexican government to send all of the Colorado River to agriculture. Mm. So, I, mm -hmm. I, and I have a picture. I have an aerial picture of that in the book that shows the main stem of the river getting sent off to the east, and then this little tiny trickle uh, that goes down the the floodplain of the historic floodplain of the Colorado. But we need to change the narrative about all of that, you know, from from hopeless to hopeful, because there's incredible work going on to restore sections of the Colorado River in Mexico. And, and when we say the river is dead or dying, that's an insult both to the river and to the river keepers who are working so hard to steward their piece of this watershed. And and that's a lot of what I wanted to get to is I wanted people to sort of see themselves in the good work of others who are just selflessly giving every day of their lives to this watershed and to the potential, to see the potential and to reimagine, you know, what's possible even as water is diminished from climate change. And it's also an insult to the river herself because she has every intention of reaching the sea as she did for six million years. And I think for people to care, they need to know the river because it is magnificent. Right. And from all of your research, as you were talking to people and learning everything that you possibly could about the river, what are the biggest threats that's currently going against the Colorado River? Why is it such in dire straits essentially right now? Okay. So we look to that place on the top of the Continental Divide. And let's say that place is James Peak that is in between the Denver metro area and Winter Park. So if we look to that place in between the Fraser River Valley and, and the Denver metro area, and we look atop the Continental Divide and we see all that snow piling up now, and we're having a pretty good season so far, so everybody's got their fingers crossed, that's where our water comes from. You know, folks, folks will give you different answers about 
where the water comes from the tap or from the reservoir, but it all originates at the top of the Rocky Mountains. And over the last 23 years, we've been in a mega drought. People call it aridification or desertification. Basically, the West is drying out because of climate change. So we get less snow year over year. And then it's complicated by when the snow runs off in spring, in April and May and into June, it's complicated by fixed amounts of water being diverted away from, from the rivers and also by a dried out uh, landscape. So the land, like soil moisture content last year was about 50% of normal. So when we, we peaked at about 90% of historic average snowpack, but the return to Lake Powell was way less than that. It was like 38% or something. So all of that water got either diverted or soaked up by the land. And then it started out with, you know, less snowpack than we would like to have. So it's just one thing after another that's kind of robbing the runoff that, that reaches Lake Powell, which stores the water that the upper basin states send downstream, stores that water, sends it through the Grand Canyon and gets stored again in Lake Mead. And that's how it gets delivered to the lower basin states. There's less water at the headwaters. It gets sucked up by the land and by diversion. And then the delivery downstream isn't what anybody would hope for. And so that's what's put us in this crisis situation. But I, of all the folks I work with, I don't think anybody expected us to be in uh, such dire straits in 2023. So yeah, we're in a tough spot. What does that mean? We have to change our relationship to water in the American West. And certainly a lot of smart people are working on the math problem the disparity between how much water we have and how much water is allocated. A big part of that problem is that, so the upper basin states, we use a percentage of the water we have. The lower basin states use fixed amounts. So we have to, in the upper basin states, deliver those fixed amounts. Well, those fixed amounts exceed the amount of water we actually have. And, and all of that's measured by acre feet of, of river. And, you know, for reference, in 1922, we were thought to have as much as like 18 million acre feet. An acre foot of water is a football field one foot deep. Uh, so 18 million, that wasn't the actual amount. The river got all divvied up. There was less water than what was thought to be there. And then over time, there's even less and less and less. And that's what's put us in this situation. If you think of it this way, it, without getting into all of the numbers, which can get pretty tedious, I don't want to put people to sleep. <laughs> um, if you had a business and, and, and you had $18 million in money going out and you only had 10 or $12 million coming in, you'd go out of business pretty fast. Or if it was your personal checking account. So we're over allocated and we're getting less and less water in the system year over year. And that's why we're in this shape right now. Yes, that makes total sense. And having lived in the area, you know, for close to a decade, seeing it firsthand, you know, the scary fires, there's, it's so much more real when you see it, you know, versus other parts of the world that might have more water. It's, it's definitely a thing. And, and then of course you seeing the images, like you said, of, essentially the bathtub ring around like Mead and like Powell and we're in all these big droughts and everything. But one thing that I love about your story that you've brought up multiple times is you did an incredible job of both highlighting how alive the river still is and also the people that are the river stewards that are doing the work to restore the river and also to be essentially her voice. So how did you meet some of the guests in your book? And I would love, since I'm right, I'm listening, I'm probably the only one that's had the chance to read the book so far since it's just now coming out in print. Maybe share a few of those stories of some of the people you met that just really moved you. How did you meet them and what is their story? How were they changing the river for the better? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, initially, I, I thought I need to see as much of the watershed as I can. And so how am I going to do this? You know, I, I can't 
photograph all of the Colorado River system. It's 245,000 square miles, and the river is 1,450 miles long. So, so it took me about two years to see, you know, a good bit of the watershed. I had already been working with Audubon Rockies, so uh, and they do raft trips. I started with a raft trip down the Yampa River with them, and also a backpacking trip with my wife and friends in Bears Ears. I knew I wanted to do, I wanted to have a significant indigenous story in the book and honor those those folks, which turned out to be just incredibly meaningful work for me. So I traveled around, I, I, I knew, for instance, Tom Kerner, who runs Seeds Giddy National Wildlife Refuge in Wyoming, and I went up to see Tom, and I saw the potential of that place. And so, and he's a friend, you know, and it, it very encouraging, very supportive. And everybody I approached, Brooke, was incredibly supportive of this idea mm -hmm. to tell a story about the river itself. And so Tom and I agreed we'd we'd like to, you know, work together a few times a year. And I kept going back to Seeds Giddy. I met Mary Harner, who's a, a river ecologist, PhD with the Platte Basin time lapse. And Mary studies three rivers. One of them is the Gila, the upper Gila River in New Mexico. So Mary introduced me to Martha Cooper, who's just doing incredible work and engaged in the community and, and with community support, uh, stopped a dam that would have destroyed the headwaters of the Gila River. And it was it was all incremental. I reached out to Utah to Nebuchadnezzar, which is the five tribe coalition for bears ears for the protection of bears ears. And uh, there was an invitation to go to the summer gathering in in bears ears and, and the whole public and everybody's invited and the, the indigenous people put on this big event and just share it all with people and and you know they want partners to go out and tell the story the right way and from that, I thought I'd work on the traditional foods program that they have where they're helping folks grow corn, beans, squash, and the, the little bear's ears potato. Interestingly, the borders that were proposed for bear's ears national monument were created by mapping the vegetation plots of the ancestral Puebloans that were there, whatever it was, 1200 years ago or something but had a thriving culture in, in the canyons and in, in that whole region around Bears Ears. So they mapped the vegetation plots to know where their ancestors were. And then I had the good fortune of being able to work with the Wilson family in Monument Valley and some other folks who are the ancestors of those people. I, I, the story was told for a long time that the ancestral Puebloans just died out, but but in fact, the people are still here. And it was really important to me to tell that story, that the people are still here, and to, to get into sort of the sacredness of, of water in the arid west. One day I was driving along through Navajo country, and uh, on NPR, I heard some talk about the San Pedro River and the groundwater issue. And, and at the time, the Interior Secretary, David Barnhart, had authorized the development of this huge uh, housing development on the San Pedro, and there wasn't water for it. And I thought, mm. well, I need to know more about this. And so I went down and saw Holly Richter and decided to make a chapter out of that that's kind of emblematic of the groundwater issue and how groundwater and surface water work together. And here we have this river, the San Pedro, that starts in Mexico. It's one of only two rivers that flows south to north across the border, and it's hemispherically important is the way Holly puts it, because it's of its north to south orientation and where it is in the world um, for migrating birds, particularly neotropical migrants, songbirds, mm -hmm. they need this, this river and there needs to be surface water. And so people are actually, you know, infiltrating the groundwater to raise the surface level for the health of the river. And this is heroic work that is going on. And, and that's what I was looking for was just people doing, you know, incredible work that that you don't necessarily know about. And then if we if we look at all these tributaries that I've just spoken about, those are the arteries of the Colorado River. And it adds to me, it adds a lot of depth to that story than if I just spent my time on the main stem of the Colorado. You know, let's get into what a watershed is, what a watershed looks like, and and who are the people doing great work and and how does that 
serve as reference for what is possible, for reimagining the possible for this river system. And I knew I needed to get to the Colorado River Delta and that happened late in the project. But boy, what a hopeful story I found down there. When the story that you've heard for decades is the Colorado River just dies up, it dries up in Mexico, turns out not to be true. It's pretty damn refreshing because there's, you know, we have to honor the, the incredible work against all odds that people are doing in, in an internationally cooperative way or binationally. Yeah, it just it was all organic, Brooke, in how I, I went about constructing the places that I wanted to feature in the story. And then the Colorado River, River herself ties it all together. Right. And I love that you bring up that last part, because I didn't know about this thing called the pulse flow that happened and how monumental that was for the Colorado River. So actually, could you maybe talk a little bit more about that and what it signified? And especially for those, you know, water keepers down there, that was, it was so inspirational and they've been working decades for that to happen and it did. So maybe could you go down into that story a little bit more? Sure. There's a water shortage sharing agreement between the United States and Mexico and the United States is helping Mexicali agriculture be more efficient in their use of, of water. And within the scope of that agreement, it was decided that and, and, and the story gets gets pretty involved, but it was decided that a small trickle of water would be diverted for restoration in Mexico. And it started with a pulse flow in 2014, and I wasn't there for it, so I, you know, I, I wish I had ex experienced that personally, but essentially 100,000 acre feet of water, which is a good amount of water, was sent through the Morelos Dam down the original historic floodplain of the Colorado, and so for the first time in 60 years, or almost 60 years at that time, 2014, so over 50 years, for the first time, there was the Colorado River is flowing in its floodplain in the Delta all the way to the sea. And people experienced that in a really deep and meaningful way. Some remembered the river from prior to 1960, the older folks, others, like a couple of the young people I met were completely taken by the river and 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 have that tactile feel for the river. And I and I met Mary Lou Sandoval, who I asked her, you know, what what she's in her 20s, what drew you to this river conservation? She said it was the pulse flow. Mm -hmm. I live on the lease Rio, Colorado, she told me, which is just barely on the Mexican side, named after the river, but the river doesn't flow through my town. And then when the river came through my town, she, she was just very blown away, just, just drawn to the river. And she wanted, she made the decision. And at that time, she wanted to be involved in river conservation. It was completely heartwarming. And so with less, less than 1% of the historic flow, conservation groups on both the Mexican side and the US side are working together to restore sections of habitat. And there's a Raise the River Alliance of conservation groups and I was working with Pro Natura and the rest day in, in Mexico, and, and, and they took me to restoration sites and also a site that was about to be restored so I could see that context of just how, how gnarly it was with invasive species and, and no water, of course. And, and they scraped those sites clean, and they have greenhouses that are growing all of the plants that are supposed to be there, and then they restore the vegetation, and they run a little bit of water through there and the, the place just explodes with life. And one of those sites, the Miguel Alleman site, when they started, it had 23 bird species on the site. And 10 years later, it has 123 bird species. Amazing. And, and 18 million birds migrate across the Colorado River Delta in spring. So do you think they need that habitat? They absolutely do. And the thing that you you find out when you get into this work is that not only is there abundant life wherever rivers flow, but if you have willow and cottonwood present, both cousins of the poplar family, then you have the woody structure that all of this wildlife needs. And boy, oh boy, do you have abundance and wildlife richness in those spaces. Yeah, I thought it was an incredible story. And again, because in 2014, I was graduating from Ohio State, just out 
in the Midwest and I I didn't hear any of this. Like, it's just so incredible how something so important, you know, I was a new conservation student, just graduated zoology and I had never heard of this story. So I was really glad that you wrote about it and also the people that were so greatly impacted. And there was also one part that you wrote about in this specific part of the story when you were down there, you felt compelled to go visit the border wall and you seem to have been very moved by it. I could like, I could feel the emotion as you were writing about it. Could you actually talk about that a little bit more? Why did you feel like you needed to go see the border wall and maybe just also share some of the emotions that you felt when you actually looked at it and <laughs> pretty much came almost in touching distance of it, it seemed like. Oh, I have touched it. Yeah. I don't know why I'm drawn to the border wall when I'm that far south, but I think it's kind of, you know, like a dam on a river system is a wholly unnatural act to, you know, to, to impound a river. Of course, when you go to one of these reservoirs, it's still the same river, but it doesn't feel the same and it doesn't have the abundance of life and the diversity. And so there's that. And then you know, similarly, the border wall, it's completely unnatural to have a wall going across a, a landscape, an artificial boundary. And I think that if we look at the West and just look at the big picture and pull back, maybe take a, a view from space, we've created so many barriers. We think of oftentimes of the West as being wide open and being the wild West. But if you look at, at it from the air, it's a lot of fences and roads and power lines and dams and, and a border wall. And so I think I'm drawn to it just because it's so damned unnatural and, and feels wrongful, you know, that we, we're not achieving the results that the people who build these walls would like to have. So for instance, on the San Pedro River, when I first went there, I got these really cryptic directions of how to get to the border wall. And, and, and it was from Holly Richter. And she's like, Dave, you'll see a lot of scary signs, but it's okay. You know? And so <laughs> you can go past properties that are like, they, they have big fences and, and keep out and, and all of that stuff. And then you get, you see the wall and the wall just appears and it's, it, it, it looks so gigantic at first. And, and there's a, a road that goes along the wall. And, and so I follow that road and I see the cottonwood trees down the hill. And I know that's the floodplain of the San Pedro River. And I went down there and there was a border patrol car and an and, and officer there. And, and, I, and I walked to the wall and I looked at it. And, and at that time, there was just those iron X's kind of a wall so about waist high going across the floodplain because of course when the river floods you you can't have a giant wall there the water has to flow through somehow um, or it'll wreak havoc and and these rivers in the southwest are very flashy or flash flood prone so when there's a big storm on the mexican side whole ponderosa trees can can flow down the river system and so it, it goes from being a very tame quiet river to being a raging torrent and, and and the water could still flow through those bollards, I guess they are at that time. And I, I went there and I, I, I stood in that space for a long time and, and, and just listened to the birds and watched the cottonwoods sway. And when I turned around away from the border wall, I looked into the San Pedro conservation area, um, national conservation area, and it was just so beautiful with the the tall prairie grasses in and cottonwoods and and the it was dry floodplain at the time the water is at that point in late fall is is flowing beneath the surface but it was magnificent on one side and on the other side it felt so wrongful and so since then there's been a bridge built you can't get there the, the border patrol doesn't want you to get to that space there's been a bridge and lights and taller wall built now a jaguar or an ocelot cannot cross the border, neither, really a turtle can't get through the border. So long answer to your question, but I just, I feel like I have to, I have to stand in that space to be able to talk about it. And it, and it hurts to see the land bifurcated that way. Yeah, I was moved drastically by seeing your photo because I put it in perspective as someone who's not seen it myself. I just, as 
you know, I'm a predator biologist. So to know that jaguars are going to have almost no, or any cats, you know, any wolves or coyotes, anything, fox, like there's no chance for them to move on this landscape. And those are the species that, you know, I care so much about personally, pumas, everything. And I know that in theory, you know, like in my head, I'm always sad when wildlife can't move, but to see the photo where you have, where you're like standing on um, like some sort of outcrop over this beautiful landscape. And then out of, you just see a line and it's the wall, like this cutting through this landscape and it looks so wrong and out of place. And that was the first time I've seen it in context. And I had to stop for a while because one, I was reading your words and I, and you did a great job of talking through it and, and what it did for you. And you like going up to the wall and, and why you were so compelled to do that, but then also bringing me with you and me seeing it for the first time. And I was just, whoa, I was like, this is like, <laughs> I was mad when it was put into place, but now like I'm double mad because now I actually see it and I'm not even there. Like it, it wasn't a film or anything, it was your words and this one very moving image of this incredible landscape with this line cutting right through it, right in the middle of it. It was nuts. It was nuts. So I, I wanted to talk about that because it, it, it's definitely part of the whole story here and and this beautiful landscape the colorado river goes through and we've cut it in half just because of political stuff that yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah, and and i don't want to get into the political aspects i just think we can be better as a society and rivers connect and so if there's 40 million of us in this watershed and and each of us in our own way go to the river and experience, and whatever that is for you, whether it's you know the, the, the creek that feeds the tributary that feeds the Colorado. But if we, if we go into these still functioning places and we see what a riverine environment really is, and we feel our connection to the other 40 million people, and, and, we, when, and we sense our place in the watershed, then we can see how how it all kind of fits together. And it's that way on the border too. You know, if you spend some time there rather than on cable news, then you realize that it, that it is an achingly beautiful landscape that is compromised because of over pumping of groundwater and, and other stuff, but it's still achingly beautiful. And it's still supporting all of those animals that we just talked about and those big migrations and Allison Holleran did an inc- of Audubon Rockies did an incredible job of, of writing about those migrations that she called Earth's breath. And if you can imagine the earth breathing and, and that you're in that space and you're experiencing that. And then I think we start to change our relationship to rivers and to this landscape. And we start to see ourselves in this place differently. I think that's where it's at. We can be better. We have to set aside, you know, some of these just hard positions and be, allow ourselves to be open enough to be moved by the rivers. Yeah. And I also, next, I want to talk about this issue realistically. So people need water and Mm -hmm. there is no sign of the mass immigration that's happening in the West right now, slowing down. People are still moving to Denver. We still see all these pop-up communities happen. We hear about it all throughout pretty much anywhere that the Colorado River is. The area is growing massively. That's going to be more homes that need more water. That's more lawns. That's more demand on the river. And assuming that that isn't going to slow down anytime soon, how do we realistically go about this problem of our water? Are there issues, ballot issues coming up that we need to be aware of? What's going on or what needs to happen or what is happening to ensure that our water stays around in our water supply? Great question. Just for a little context, the 1922 Colorado River Compact Um, will expire in 2026. And right now, the terms of the compact are being renegotiated. 
And we've seen in the news that the lower basin states, Arizona, Nevada, and California are trying to sort out how deep the cuts will be to align the allocation with how much water we actually have. So that's part of it. And we are in a, the current crisis because, excuse me, because uh, Lake Powell is, I don't know what the number is today, let's say around 30% of capacity and it's close to Deadpool, which means the water will get so low in that reservoir that it won't flow through the Glen Canyon Dam and that would be catastrophic. And so folks are trying to figure out how do we cut enough water so we can raise the level of those of that reservoir. That's the second biggest reservoir in the United States. The first biggest reservoir, the number one is Lake Mead. I have a hard time calling them lakes because they're they're impoundments. <laughs> but Lake Mead yeah. is in is in similar shape. And I did some photography there last summer for the book. And I, I had to experience that even though you know, it's not the spirit of the story. Um, we have to have this context. So there's that. The states are going to have to figure out how to make these these big cuts, and they're in the process of doing that. And then I think all of us have to acknowledge that first of all, that there's less there's less water in the system, and so that's on a personal and and a big scale basis. Understand? Okay, you might have a right a water right on paper. But there's less water in the system. So so how you know how are we going to sort out these things? I would say, you know, you mentioned cities. So for the, to further that context, 80% of the Colorado River goes to agriculture at the bottom of the watershed. So those are those three big ag fields, Yuma, Imperial Valley, and Mexicali, plus, you know, plus others, but it's very industrial at the lower part of the basin. And markets are going to play a significant role in how we make those cuts. So we will be paying farmers to fallow their fields so that that water can go to the river instead of being sucked up by agriculture. I'm not saying anything bad about agriculture. We all need agriculture, but we also acknowledge that 80% of the river goes to agriculture. So market dynamics will called de demand management will play a very significant role as far as the cities go think of the big cities most of the big cities are are, are geographically outside of the watershed but they get their water through diversions so denver albuquerque tucson phoenix las vegas los angeles san diego all get diverted colorado river water they're all reducing their water usage and and that's laudable however i don't think we're asking the right question the question is are we doing everything we possibly can and when we pour water on the ground it's gone household water largely gets recycled we'll have to do a better job of reutilizing gray water and people have you know a reaction to drinking toilet water for instance but scientifically we can reuse this this water in a, on a bigger scale. As far as our, our use of water in the cities, we're gonna have to change what we're doing with ornamental lawns. And we're starting to see Las Vegas started it. Las Vegas gets a bad rap for the casinos, but largely they're doing an incredible job with water conservation. Throughout this watershed, I think we'll all be tearing out our lawns in the next five years, and we're gonna have to stop all of this lawn irrigation or not all of it, but you know, a good bit of it. And that'll contribute some, but largely the, the, the reductions are gonna have to come from those big agricultural users. And, and I don't know how you, you don't unpin all of that. You use market dynamics. I don't get into crop mix, but I think for context, it's important to know that a third of the Colorado River goes to growing alfalfa for cattle. And is that our highest and best use for the river? Somebody's gonna have to answer that question. Mm -hmm. um, for me, uh, I want people to go to the river. I want people to have their own relationship with the river. I want them to feel the power of this watershed. And, you know, the book is about taking you to the river. And yeah, we need all of that other context. But if we're to care, we're going to have to know this, this river system on a deeper level than just taking water from a tap or sprinkling it on our lawns. We are not whole as a watershed community until everybody has access to clean water. And the work I did 
with Utah Denebakea, mostly in the Monument Valley and Bears Ears region, revealed hardship that is unspeakable in the United States in 2023, where people don't have access to clean water. And so these Native American people have to have a dedicated three quarter ton pickup truck with a 325 gallon tank in the back of it. And they have to go to a place to collect water from a garden hose and spend two and a half or three hours a day just collecting water. And then they have to bring it home and they put it in cisterns to have water for horses and sheep in the house. And so we have to figure out that piece. Everybody has to have access to clean water and there's funding there. I was introduced by Ann Castle, who's a cornerstone of this story. She is now the appointed by Joe Biden commissioner of the upper Colorado River Basin a renegotiations of the terms of the compact. And Anne, during the pandemic, saw this with her partner, Bitta Becker, who is Navajo Diné, saw this enormous need for, for folks on these reservations to have access to clean water. And so that's critical. And there's funding there now. And hopefully we can bridge that gap because it's, it's a third world situation on the reservations. And I think we're going to have to feel a connection to each other as watershed neighbors. Did right, I answer yeah. your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. It did. Yes, it did. Because, and also too, yeah, that, that might make the, the cuts hurt less. Because at the end of the day, me having been in this field now for a while, it's all about compromise. Yes, us that we, we love nature and we want it to be back to its pristine state as much as possible. We just know we can only ask so much of people. So what is the balance? How do we get a healthy river again, while also making sure that our society is okay, that we, we do have the water that we need, we are able to turn on the tap and everyone has access to clean, healthy water. And so to do that, <laughs> there has to be some give and take. And so like, what is the give and take here? So that was more of what that question was all about. It's just, we as conservationists, we have to look everything at everything with a realistic lens of like, this isn't going to stop. People are going to continue golfing. They are going to continue having pools and, and ornamental lawns and stuff like that. So how do we get as many people on board as possible to make sure that our river and our waters are healthy? So what, what is the line? Do we, you know, do we have more river parties where everyone really falls in love with the river? You know, like, I don't know. <laughs> what is it? What is happening on a policy level? Because I've come to find when it comes to conservation, a lot of things, there is a lot that we can do as individuals, but if the policies don't change, then there's only so much that can happen. So like what is happening in government, you know? So that's great to hear that in 2026, there might be some big changes in the way the Colorado River is used and diverted and how much is able to go to each state. So we'll definitely have to have a an update then. And on that note, your book is left very open-ended and I felt like that was intentional. There isn't an end to your book. There isn't. So if you could write the end of your story, of the Living River story, maybe as the second edition after things are happening, what do you want to be or hope to be in those final pages? As far as how the book would end, it it, it is intentional that I, I mean, I, I think the ending is that that we have to each in our own, own way develop a new relationship to the river and to water in the West. And what I would like to see happen is, of course, for us to find a way to live within our means. A lot of these decisions are going to be made by other people and we're going to see it in, in big cuts. And, you know, Southern California might get mad that they can't wash their cars for a period of time or or that we're across the, the watershed. We're, we're tearing out lawns and, and changing how we live. I remember at the very beginning, uh, while backpacking bear's ears, I ran into a guy who was a hydrologist and we were talking about water and he said, Dave, do you think Phoenix is ready to start using compostable toilets? And I laughed at the idea, you know, and, and maybe we don't, we don't get to that point because there's only so far conservation can take us. It's going to be a lot of big cuts, right? Because to get in line with the amount of water we have. But I think, I think that question, you know, brings to mind that next question, which is, are we doing everything we possibly can? And for people to accept the cuts that are coming, 
which are going to come well before 2026 because of the dire straits that we're in today. And for people to, to, to sort of embrace our water truth, they have to experience the river for themselves. And so what I want to see is, is us align ourselves with the, the river we have and to acknowledge the river we have. And so we'll use those market dynamics and, and renegotiations to get agriculture where it needs to be. And then for the rest of us, I'm real serious about this business of, of our relationship to the rivers and to changing the narrative. And we need just a lot more river keepers in this to, to be able to, to accept our water truth and to stop acting like it's 1950 and to say, you know what? We live in the arid West and we only have so much water to go around. And it's a privilege to live in the American West. And part of that privilege is to work with the rivers and not in an adversarial way, as if somehow the river has given up and isn't given us as much water as it used to. In fact, you know, Bitta Becker will say that that nature is still in charge and nature is going to decide, you know, how many of us continue to be able to live in the American West if we don't get our act together. So we need to live in concert with our environment. And, and it's possible to have healthy rivers that benefit wildlife and people and healthy economies, but we're going to have to change dramatically as a society. And, and it would be helpful if a lot more people were in love with these rivers and had, had a, a meaningful relationship to water in the West. Yes. I almost wonder when those cuts happen, just It'll be an interesting social experiment, I think, because how many people have migrated from other areas if there will be a mass exodus? <laughs> if they're like, I want a swimming pool and I'm not allowed to have one anymore, you know? I'm just I'm just curious. I'm just curious to see how many people are going to say, F this, I'm gone. I mean, it was cool Denver, but like, I can no longer do this, so I'm going to go. And I'm just I'm just curious. I'm just curious to see what what will come of that if that means we'll slow growth a lot or yeah i don't know i guess we'll find out won't we stay tuned to be determined <laughs> i think most most experts in the watershed will tell you that growth is still possible but it has to be smart mm -hmm. and a lot of a lot of how we grow will be determined by our love affair with ornamental lawns mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. So are we going to still have lawns in hot, arid environments? Probably not. So what does that look like? It's acknowledging where we live in many respects. So we've created a lot of unnatural environments that demand a lot of water. That has to change. And how we have these big industrial agricultural places uh, in the lower part of the basin, that's going to have to change too. I don't know what that looks like. I'm not advocating for changing crop mix, but when you look at it and you say a third of the river goes to alfalfa to feed cows, that doesn't feel right. So, you know, that it's all going to have to shift as things must because nature is deciding. She's had it's enough. On, it's on <laughs> us. It's on us, you know. How, yeah. <laughs> how, how badly do we want to have vibrant economies and vibrant rivers in the American West? We'll see. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's make a switch now to you for a little bit. I have not written a book. And after reading yours, I could tell how much work you had to put together to put this thing together, which I'm sure was a challenging endeavor. So what was it like for you to put this thing together? I mean, like, it's a six-year project. I don't even know how you sifted through your photos to select which one to put in there on every page. Like, that alone had to have taken weeks upon weeks. So yeah, tell us a little bit more of like, what was it actually like for you to do this and put this book together? Mm. Well, I, I had, I suppose a couple of years ago, I had created an outline, a chapter outline, and I had those place-based chapters identified. That changed a little bit, but that was kind of a compass of, okay, you know, I want to focus on these particular areas that are, that are emblematic of other places in the watershed. So it gives people a touchstone that they can relate to, depending on perhaps where they are located in the geography of the Colorado River watershed. So that was part of it. And all of the pictures, just about all of the pictures were made with intention. 
not a lot of serendipity in there, although you do leave space for, you know, of course, things, things change while you're out in the field, you know, um, somebody tells you there's a bobcat on a bluff across Ooh. the Green River at Seedskiddy, and and yeah. that just turned on a light, and I spent a whole week looking for that bobcat. So you leave space for those kinds of things, but generally, when I go out, I have a roadmap of the pictures I want to make and the reasons I want to make them and the people I want to work with, and so I create a lot of structure around making sure that all of those expeditions are as productive from a storytelling standpoint as they can be. And it's kind of like a funnel. You start out with, you know, all these pictures you need. And as you go along, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller to where, you know, I just need, like, I need to go to the Colorado River Delta in Mexico and I need six pictures. <laughs> of course, you, you make more than that, but, but that's, that's kind of, it all gets distilled down to what does the story need? And the, if you're tuned into your own story, the story will tell you. And there's a point along the way where you realize I'm no longer directing all of this. The story is taking me. The river is taking me where I need to go to make these images and to the people that I need to, to get to know better and to bring their story to life because those people are doing such heroic work. And so all of that was quite organic, but I added a lot of structure to it before I went out in the field to make these pictures with intention. What was the other part of the question? I just, what was, what was oh, putting it together? Yeah, yeah. yeah putting putting it the book together. Oh, so last fall, our funder challenged Braided River to produce a book as, as soon as we could because of the need to have this foundational piece to tell, to tell the story of why all of this great work in the watershed matters and to remind people that there's a river because we're talking so much about the plumbing system dams and reservoirs and, and delivering water to people and agriculture that we forget that there's this vibrant dynamic river system and uh, started out in 2022 writing and braided river asked me to write the whole book there's a couple pieces that were written by others Anne castle wrote a beautiful forward yes cynthia wilson wrote a beautiful piece uh cynthia wilson is navajo Diné just a beautiful person, beautiful family. She wrote a wonderful piece called My Journey to Bears Ears. While I was writing, I wasn't able to get to the Colorado River Delta. So that chapter is a lovely interview with Jennifer Pitt, who's been working in conservation on the Delta for something like three decades, I think. She gave us depth and context and, and stories and people that that I never would have been able to to write about. So that was that was really wonderful. And then, you know, I just dug in chapter by chapter and tried to go deep into the experiences that I had, because I think my value as an author is that I can I can bring those experiences to life and I can take people to the river. And I think to your early question about why a book, that's that's what books do is they give you the space and time to have enough experiences to take people deep into place and, and the power of place and the power that the rivers bring to these places. So each story has some of those deep experiences in it that really transcended the whole story for me. Uh, I, I'm transformed by this project. I'm not the same person that I started out as because of how moved I am by the Colorado River and her tributaries. Yeah, I could feel that people. the entire way. I could feel that, absolutely. The way you wrote about it is just was just so beautiful, like traveling with you. Like you took me from my bed where I read this <laughs> and brought me to all these different places along the Colorado watershed, which is beautiful. So what do you hope to, is the actual outcome of this? Like let's, the the book is out then what do you hope happens after that? <laughs> the first batch of books. So I received two books yesterday from a shipment of 500 that Helen Chirula brought in early because of the need to get them in the hands of decision makers. So I, I got two books and the other 498 are going to go to decision makers. And what the book does for those folks is it reminds them that, yes, there's a river. There are rivers that need, that need us too. You know, we have we have a 
significant need to figure out how to deliver water to 40 million people and to agriculture and to to make water allocation cuts that make sense that aren't just with a you know with an axe but but maybe more precision type water cuts to where we don't impact people negatively through no fault of their own that sort of thing but more importantly we need to ground people in this this river system and how magical it is and just how incredible she is who, that everything in our environment no matter where we live in this watershed was shaped and changed by water and including us. Regardless of whether you're a water manager or somebody at home reading this book, what I want you to feel is that you're a part of this watershed. You're part of something bigger. You're part of a watershed community. And it's this river system that makes your life possible, that makes your life rich. And it's kind of the great equalizer, you know, no matter what our circumstances are in life, we owe that life to these Western rivers. And I think, you know, to leave it open-ended, if, if you know where your water comes from and you go to the river and you spend some time there, it will change you. And that's what I want. I want people to be changed in a very deep and meaningful way as I was. And, you know, I'm going to continue doing this work probably for the rest of my life. And I can't wait to peel back more layers. But Ultimately, we can have healthy rivers and we can have healthy economies, but we're going to have to figure it out pretty darn quick. Yeah. Hey, I wanted to cut in for a brief moment before we continue on. Dave and I sat back down to record the part you are about to hear. Our connection was a little spotty, but the content is so good that I had to keep it in. Get ready for lots of vulnerability and healing from both of us. Okay, back to the conversation. So about my journey, it's not just about me. It's never been about me. I've had lots of support throughout the seven years of working this project. And uh, I've had Braided River and Walton Family Foundation and Light Hawk Flew the Flights and all of these wonder river, wonderful river keepers uh, in the conservation community. Everybody I contacted supported this journey and no one was more supportive than my wife marla marla and i roamed the mountains for 30 years before this project or almost 30 years crossed over passes and and even though we didn't know it we were studying snowpack and rivers throughout that time and marla supported everything pho photography for me and every idea i ever had she was the one who made it possible for me to go full-time from a corporate career to conservation photography. And when COVID hit, Marla was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, liposarcoma, and the diagnosis was bad, the prognosis was bad, and she gave that no quarter. Marla fought as hard as she possibly could through really difficult chemo. And in, uh, in 2021, she had clean scans and she recovered her strength completely and she was a powerhouse again. Marla was a great athlete. We backpacked five times that year. The, the cancer came back and there were more surgeries. And Marla in, in 2022 was, was losing ground, but she never, ever, ever gave up hope. And that was a gift to me. And although Marla ran out of time, she remained hopeful up until the very end. And, and she passed in May of 2022. So. I always thought nobody really knew me unless they knew my wife. And it was important for me to share that with you. Yes, and I'm glad that you can take a moment to honor her and everything that she meant for you. And I love that in the back of the book that you had the space and the opportunity to honor her and her support. And just like, didn't you tell me that your photograph of you is her first published photograph of your headshot and everything. Yeah. Uh, how gorgeous, yeah. how beautiful. Thanks for giving me the space to do that. Yeah. I hope, I hope that was as good as I wanted it to be, but it's just, it's just super important. I can't, you know, it's a funny thing, Brooke, because, you know, I don't, I want my purpose to be really pure with sharing this part mm -hmm. of the story. You know, I don't want anybody to ever feel like it's gimmicky. And, but it's important and, you know, stuff happens along the way too. We don't just go out and do projects and 
come back for the book, you know. Yeah. But life, life is happening the whole time, so. And can, can I ask you something as somebody who I've shared a little bit with you has also going through something, not, nothing on your level, but also going through some pretty serious stuff in my personal life as well. How did you find the strength within yourself to continue on this project when you were going through what I would imagine was one of the most difficult things you've ever had to experience in your personal life. What kept you going and waking up every day and putting effort to your book as the most important person in your life was fading away from you? How, how did you do that? Yeah, I was, um, I was mindful that Marla was losing ground and I, I, I maintained hope because she still had hope. And so people have asked me, well, how did you keep writing? You know, cause I was writing the book in the spring of 22 and when all of this was happening and I found myself writing just for her. And then I would read her those pieces in the evening and she delighted in the writing and she encouraged that. And I showed her pictures. She made a couple image selections. She loved this story and she loved me and believed in me. And that was enough. And um, she would also expect me to go on. And, and after she passed, um, it took some time, but I was able to pick myself up and, and return to my purpose and make a trip to Mexico and tell the rest of that story, mindful of her all along. And, and I went to Mexico looking for hope and I found, I found hope in river keepers there who were, you know, young folks that are dedicating their careers to the Colorado River where people say there is no river, but they're restoring habitat and the birds are returning and it's, it's magical. So, you know, there's a lot of metaphors with rivers and chief among them is life. Rivers are life. And, and, uh, and they can be lots of things to us. And for me personally, now I go to the river to heal. Mm -hmm. That just gave me goosebumps. Like, oh, uh, yeah, that almost, I almost need a second there. Um, I just, I just wanted, Ooh. Brooke, I, I just wanted there to be a good deal of heart in, in this, you know, because all yeah. of this, all of this stuff comes from the heart. I don't mind being vulnerable. I'll, I'll, I'll share that piece of myself every time if, if it helps somebody else, you know? Yeah. And, and on that, speaking to me or anybody else that might be listening, who's personally going through something rather difficult in their own personal life, what advice would you have for somebody like that to continue on their purpose and their passion, even if something is really serious going on in their personal life? Do you have any words of wisdom or, or tips, or I, I don't know if tips is the right term, but if you could speak to those people that might be having a hard time what what would you say to them? Well, initially, <clears throat> I thought of how often Joe Biden says that he returned to his purpose to to find, you know, something to to look forward to when he went through his tragedies. And I thought of that initially. I think there's there's always going to be a good bit of introspection and 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 you find out that there's people in your life that, that care deeply about you and that love you and and you know i had i had students sending me books and i had people visiting and you know i i felt the collective love of our community and then there's there's the voice in your head you know the internal dialogue and i think one way or another we have to take a a look inside and say you know what i am good enough I can't pick myself up. I, I am an independent person on my own. Um, and you take a step and then you don't run from the pain ever. You, you embrace the pain and you find a way to, 
make peace with it, even if just for a moment. And then you take another step. And there will be setbacks and they will be devastating. When the book came, um, I, I, I was really sad for like four days and I realized it was because I couldn't share it with my wife, you know. But then I thought about it and I realized she experienced the whole thing viscerally. She experienced all of it. And she was here for every bit of it. And she encouraged every moment along the way. And Marla believed in me fully. And, and you know, that's a big thing when you're creative. Sometimes you, you feel like you're the Lone Ranger yeah. in, in, in some of these moments with just this idea and telling a story and, and, um, and to have people around you that, that have your back, that believe in you matters a lot. So I don't have any, there's no silver bullets, there's no magic answers, but I think that the voice in your head needs to say, I am good enough and I can move forward. And if not today, then today I'll work on, you know, being healthier and exercising and getting out and being in nature. I had an indigenous friend, I sent Cynthia Wilson, who's in the book, a note after Marla passed, and she talked to me about spending time in nature, deep time in nature, which is like planting seeds to heal the earth. And that was really beautiful and eloquent and meant the world to me, you know? Mm. And so we just find our way and trust that we're good people and that in time, it'll all be all right. I love that idea of going in nature and spending some deep time and planting seeds, like probably metaphorically and actually literally, maybe I need to go do a little bit of that myself. I feel like I've been, my mind, I, I've told you a little bit about what's going on, but I've almost felt like I've been running from the pain and I feel like you've embraced it and to help yourself heal. And I feel like sometimes I don't know if it's just my personality. Maybe someone listening might feel the same way. We have a tendency of running away from it when that's probably not the healthiest thing to do. Even if sometimes we don't want to face it, it might be the better thing to do. And it sounds like you've, you've really, you know, you've done that. And, and you're, I'm so grateful that you're willing to talk about it too. And so openly about it. And, and again, I think that wasn't it, when you and I sat down the first time you had just sent off the final copy of your book, right? Like the final the written. manuscript. Yeah. 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 I remember that. I remember that. And, and we sat down and talked about your wife for a long time during that too. And just how much that mm. meant, meant to you and how beautiful that was. So, I mean, I'm grateful that she was a part of your journey because I'm sure she had a big influence and helped keep you going. I mean, six years is a long time to be working on this project. And I'm sure that she was just as much in it as, as you were, you know. She picked me up so many times, Brooke, and <laughs> dusted me off and said, you're good enough, you know, you've got this. It's the best story you could, you know, it's the best thing you could be working on, that kind of thing. So, um, I, you know, I think there's something in there for all of us, and, um, you know, if you need someone to listen anytime, I'm here for you. So, and I, I'm sorry you're going through this. Um, I don't, I don't compare grieving or pain. Everybody's going through something. I think that's an important perspective to have. Somebody told me early on that everybody you know is going through something you know nothing about. Mm. And cult culturally, we shy away from being vulnerable because. We have fear that people are going to judge that. And um, <laughs> once I uh, broke down in the middle of a busy bank lobby, <laughs> I figured I could cry in front of anybody. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just don't hide any of it because that's that wouldn't be who I am. You know? Right. Our job as people is to be present for one another and to give and receive love. That's it. It's beautiful. You know how people just like come into your life at the right time. Isn't that pretty amazing how sometimes that happens? It happens every day, right? Yeah. Almost every day. I mean, people give us little nuggets and uh, 
if we're present, you know, we have to be fully present and that's a hard thing to do in today's society. And I've been working on that a lot. You know, I've been doing a good amount of work and Marla was on an enlightenment journey and she became an enlightened person and, and I want to pick up where she left off. So mm -hmm. trying to do my part. Yeah. Maybe somebody listening, they needed to hear those exact words. And that's why they decided to listen to this podcast episode today. And I know that I needed to hear those words for my own personal journey. So I hope if, if anything alone, you have a party of one right now that's impacted. So thank you. <laughs> thank you for expressing that because I know I sure appreciate it. And, and sometimes just hearing those words to keep going, you're worth it keep going your journey's worth it it's all it's all happening as it should and you will get through it too so i definitely there's, appreciate um, that there's some guided meditations online and i go to youtube quite a bit and i tune into tara brock i can send mm, you something mm -hmm. i can send you something offline but she she's she's about radical acceptance and she has a really good talk about letting go and kind of gives you some tools to work with and you know all of it helps all of it is investing in ourselves and i think the thing we lack as humans oftentimes is the the idea that there's time we have time you know society doesn't want to give us time society wants us to just be better and to snap our fingers and it doesn't work that way and it takes however long it takes but if we can get around to believing that everything isn't our fault that we are good enough and we can dive into our purpose and hopefully spend a good amount of time in nature meaningful time we can heal says the person who just cried through a podcast interview <laughs> <laughs> that was great i'm i'm grateful you did and i'm grateful to have this space where you can openly do that if that's the emotions that you're feeling in a complete just not judgmental space like i yeah. think that it's it's beautiful we all go through this and sometimes just seeing somebody else be vulnerable because ah oh, gosh like i'm sure that you've experienced it too and that's one of the big purposes behind this show and this platform is to show this side of us that i don't feel like we're allowed to show in most different media types like going on speaking on stage you know doing video interviews like a print media magazine feature like i don't feel like we can talk about this kind of stuff when this is the real part of what we do like you this is so integral part like such an integral part of your story and in all of those other media types you wouldn't have the opportunity to really talk about it and show your vulnerability so yeah sometimes i just really freaking love this show so <laughs> don't apologize for crying on here um yeah there's sometimes that i've had this like I, i've gotten pretty upset myself or other guests have you know, have had some moments where they shared some very, very personal things too and i feel like those moments are the most impactful so thank you and maybe one day i will find the vulnerability to talk a little bit more in an open space about my journey, but we'll get there. But this is not, this is not Brooke show. This is, uh, this is Dave today. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for just, being willing just, to talk about it. Just know that a lot of people love and care about you and that you matter. And we're not defined by, by others all of the time. You know, sometimes we're defined by our heart. And we have to look deeply in there sometimes to find ourselves. So you're going to be okay. You're going to be good. <laughs> you can, you. we can do that. And that's what you and I are doing right now. Yes. We're having like a healing session right now in a podcast. We're having a moment, aren't we? <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> yeah, we are. I had a feeling when we were just going to sit down for this interview, and, and I always do a whole bunch of prep work before, which isn't surprising to anybody. I was like, are we going to cry together? I feel like we might cry together. <laughs>
crying to her. Uh, yeah. Like, how beautiful would that be if we just have a moment where we cry together? Like, I don't... <laughs> oh well thank you dave thank you so much thank um, you but for maybe anybody uh so i want i want to take again take this full picture as well so let's say that somebody else maybe their life is going great and they want to know how they can help our rivers and maybe in their own backyard or abroad or or any body of water that means something to, something to them what would you like to say to those people, what what kind of advice would you like to share with anybody who wants to really step up and help our waters, no matter where they are, here or abroad? So we have to see ourselves as, you know, each of us as one of 40 million people in a watershed community. And we're connected by this one river system. It's all the same river. And, and even though for instance, cities and the major industrial agricultural fields are using less water. They're becoming more efficient. I feel like we're still not asking the right question. It's not a question of are we doing better, but are we doing the very best that we can to reduce our use of water? Because demand is our, is our only leverage point at this stage. We have to reduce demand. I think every one of us needs to ask the very important question, where does my water come from? Demand is our, is our only leverage point um, at this stage. We have to reduce demand. I think every one of us needs to ask the very important question, where does my water come from? We need to learn mm -hmm. that. And that sets off a whole journey of discovery and wonder and, and takes you to the river. And so with that, I'd like to just read the last part of the book, which is this. Look at the river we have. We can reimagine the possible when our relationships to water, our love of rivers grow and develop, and our stories reflect beauty, life, and hope when we become the river. Recovering the endangered cottonwood willow ecosystem wherever possible, providing all people with access to clean water. And by the way, indigenous people need to have access to clean water. Recharging groundwater for riverine health, protecting in-stream flows, and greening the Colorado River Delta are hopeful pieces of a holistic view for this watershed. When we become the river, these actions will simply be giving back to a watershed that all of our Western lives are built upon. When we become the river, there will be no separation between us and the river, between us and crane, warbler, trout, bobcat. When we become the river, water and all of the life supporting the here flow will be sacred. The Colorado River and her tributaries change everything they touch, including us. That is the river's promise. There may just be enough water for people, wildlife, and life in flow when we become the river. Go to the river. Speak for her. Mm. Thank you. That was Beautiful, Dave. Yes. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to get my copy. Uh, uh, from what I understand, it's in the mail right now. And so, cool. yes, I can't, I can't wait to hold it and touch it and smell it and feel it. <laughs> Feels pretty good to hold it. Yeah. Oh, I can only imagine what it felt like for you. But speaking of, so if anybody listening, they're like, wow. I really want to get my hands on this book. How do they do that? Where can they find the book? Where can they order the book? Where can they uh, possibly contact you and maybe learn more um, or any of the other resources that you would like to say, just kind of spew it all out. So Braided River is the publisher. BraidedRiver.org is their URL. I am DaveShellWalter.com and I'll have books available on my site and then all the usual outlets, Amazon and elsewhere. And then we've got a great resource page in the back of the book that uh, leads you to conservation groups doing great work and agencies and, and just a, a wonderful list of resources where people can engage uh, on any level they wish. And I'll add um, also Utah Denabakea, which is, uh, I can't think of the URL, uh, protectbearsears.org, I believe, and then also, tribalwater.org is about the universal rights to access to clean water for tribal communities. And then we'll make sure that all the rest are in the show notes. But Dave, 
thank you so much for writing this book, for sitting down with me, for inspiring us to love the Colorado River and all of our rivers, and for also taking me through some just very personal touch points. So again, Dave, thank you for all of your work and cannot wait to get your episode out. Thanks for the great work you're doing, Brooke. It's a pleasure. Wow, this conversation had me speechless, and it's rare for me to be without words. I highly recommend picking up a copy of Living River through the book's publisher, Braided River. I have listed all links in the show notes at rewatology.com. If you have a question about today's episode, please submit your question in the Rewatologist Facebook group. As always, I want to thank you for being a part of the Rewatology community. If you'd like to support the show, some zero-cost ways include subscribing to the podcast on your favorite streaming app, leaving a rating and review to boost the algorithm, which will present the podcast to more listeners, signing up for the weekly Rewardology newsletter at Rewardology.com, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and following the show on your favorite social media app. If you'd like to financially support the show and help us keep these stories on the airwaves, Consider making a monetary donation at Rewardology.com or purchase a piece of swag to show off your Rewardology love. At least 10% of proceeds from this podcast will be donated to our conservation partners. I'd also like to thank Focusrite for powering the podcast sound. If you'd like to see the Focusrite gear we use to record the show, head on over to Rewardology.com and check out Nature Podcasting under the Resources tab. Until next time, friends. Together. We will rewild the planet. Hey, thanks again for listening to this episode of Rewildology. If you like what you heard, hit that subscribe button to never miss a future episode. Do you have a cool environmental organization, travel story, or research that you'd like to share? Let me know at rewildology.com. Until next time, friends, together we will rewild the planet.